Hello everyone, it's Michelle here. Richard, I think we can start ready, if you're ready. Okay, thanks Michelle. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for our webinar series. This is uh, our third supplier webinar series and um, it's a fantastic turnout. We've got uh, 88 people registered for this one, which shows a real interest in this technology and also probably a market need for it. So today's topic is uh, about willow stick and how it can be used as a non-intrusive geophysical method to identify, map and model preferential groundwater flow paths. I think all the hydrogeologists in the room would uh, would agree that actually working out where groundwater flows, particularly in things like fracture sects, can be very challenging using monitoring wells and levels and that sort of thing. Um, the willow stick approach provides a great way of supplementing those methods to get a much clearer picture of your conceptual models. Uh, today, we're lucky, I guess just a little bit on Hydroterra before we get started. But really, uh, in terms of what we want to do with these webinar series is to generate awareness of uh, for you guys in what the technologies are that are out there and how we support those technologies in Australia to provide you with a headache free service. Um, it's also about passing on knowledge. So in a way, uh, it's, it's really important that as a supplier, we are educating you in the applications of these technologies. So in terms of Willow Stick as a company, they've been around for 15 years and really it's one of those great sort of US success stories, a company that has developed a technology and successfully commercialized it. It's something that uh, I think Australia is starting to wake up to and realize we need to start commercializing more of our great inventions too. The Willow Stick is a really good example of the successful application of that technology. Um, this particular technology has been applied in a, a wide variety of settings where you need to understand subsurface flow paths. Um, the ones we've been most involved with uh, in Australia relate to dams and tailings dams, but there's uh, particularly around mining, but also around traditional water storages. Um, but it does have broader applications like you'll see on this slide in terms of in the contaminated land space. And we have done some projects in Australia utilizing uh, the willow stick approach for, for example, mapping flow paths in fractured basalt where there was contaminant migration. Look, today we've got a really good uh, team to present and we're lucky to have the original founder of Willow Stick, Val Kofed, to present. He's the president and chief operating officer of Willow Stick. And uh, he's supported by Ryan Blanchard, who's the vice president of business development. Ryan's the main person we deal with on a on a day-to-day -day basis, and he provides us with exceptional support. Uh, quite a few of you may have already met Ryan. He's been out and uh, on some road trips uh, around Australia with us over the last few years. Our role is distributor of the technology. And uh, what does that mean? It means we provide logistical support to the technology, and that's headed up by Adam Rogan, who's a hydrogeologist with Hydroterra and uh, really between the two of us, we provide the on ground support and logistics to make sure the measurements can be collected and will I stick to the interpretation? Um, maybe in terms of questions you might have for these presenters. So Val and Adam are the main presenters today. Adam will start off. If you do have any questions, you just push that Q&A box, top of your screen there, and type questions in there. Um, at the end of the presentation, Adam will field those questions out to 
Val, Ryan, or myself and Adam to answer them as best we can. Um, next slide, thanks, Michelle. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Adam now, who's gonna give you an introduction to the technology, and then Val's gonna run through a series of case studies. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Richard. It's great to be here with the holistic team. First, I'd like to give you guys just a quick overview and outline of the presentation. So, Michelle, if you could just skip to the next slide. Thank you. So, what I'm looking to talk about here, as Richard said before, was an outline of the technology itself. So, what is a typical survey layout, uh, as well as uh, a look at the actual instrument that we use to take field measurements to conduct the survey itself. And then Val and assisted by Ryan will go and talk about a number of case studies that really show and highlight the power of this technology. And finally, we'll follow up with a Q&A session as well. So Michelle, if you can just go to the next slide. So what are the major area of focus? Well, we feel this technology fits into a number of different uh, avenues, one being the dams, canals, levees, as well as groundwater space. Definitely has applications uh, for mining, looking at tailings dams specifically, as well as the oil and gas, uh, environmental restoration, and wastewater uh, and water pipelines and tunnels as well. So there's a number of key principles that the holistic technology is based upon that are used to carry out the survey and identify these preferential flow paths. So I'd just like to outline those so you guys get an understanding of what the technology is based upon. The first one is the idea that earthen materials are poor electrical conductors. Water substantially increases the conductivity of earthen materials. Both water and electricity will, flow, will follow the path of least resistance when there is a potential difference. And finally, all electrical currents generate magnetic fields and the intensity of the magnetic field is proportional to the magnitude of the electrical current. Next, I'll run through a typical survey layout so using the principles that I just mentioned, this is a typical survey layout. You've got a, a earthen dam, uh, the dam wall, sorry, and you've got an upstream and a downstream areas. What we've got, as you can see, is an electrode in the upstream location as well as the downstream location. Connecting both of those is a circuit wire which is powered through a power supply in red. You'll see there is also uh, the Willistic instrument and the field person uh, on the surface of that dam wall. And once a survey begins, you'll see there is a electric current concentrating in the seepage path between the upstream and the downstream sections through that dam wall. So because of this electric current being generated, and there, as we just discussed, there is also a resultant magnetic field. That magnetic field is in the green, represented by the green circles. What the Willistic measure, uh, instrument is looking to do is to measure the intensity of those magnetic fields on the surface. So Michelle, if you can skip to the next one. Thank you. So what we've got here is the holistic instrument. So this is what we utilize in the field to take that, as I said, to measure that magnetic field. So it consists of a GPS and antenna, uh, a portable computer, which records all the field measurements. And then you've got the actual holistic instrument, uh, instrument and coils itself. And this is really the patented technology for holistic. It's these highly sensitive magnetic coils that sit within the instrument itself. 
So Willis Dick have found uh, or discovered a great way to miniaturize these magnetic coils. Coils of a similar sensitivity would weigh a couple of hundred pounds and normally fit in the back of uh, a ute, for example. But the willow stick coil is the size of a D battery and weighs only a few ounces. So these, uh, these coils are what gives the willow stick technology its edge and allows it to conduct and, and measure the magnetic fields. In this diagram, you'll see uh, that you've got the, once again, the electrical current uh, in yellow, and you've got the uh, magnetic field in green. And that is, as I, said, as I said, what the instrument's actually measuring, that magnetic field. So from this, uh, I'd like to hand over to Val from Willowstick. He's going to talk about a number of different case studies uh, and highlighting the, the power of technology. So Val, I'd like to hand over to you. Okay, I'm uh, opening up my... Can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, the first case study that I'd like to talk about is a, is a tailings dam, a seepage investigation of a tailings dam. Now, this is quite a complex uh, project, and that's why I selected it. Um, there's a couple of things. This, this, uh, this tailings dam uh, was built in a number of phases. I'll go, with, I'll go to through that in just a minute. But there was a number of seeps located downstream of the dam uh, in this particular area. Uh, here and here and here. You can see all these little droplets. Uh, when we surveyed the site, we actually touched every place that there was a seep, and those were the locations of the seeps. And the objective was uh, find out uh, how seepage gets through the embankment. Uh, not only where it occurs, but why it's occurring. Uh, that, 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 those are kind of important questions. When I said this is kind of a complex uh, project. Uh, this is a cross section of the dam. Uh, you can see uh, they this this uh, tan colored material is just is the tailings and poundment materials. They uh, they had a real uh, uh, tight compacted sand. They called it cyclone sand. It's very small, uh, very compacted, uh, almost impervious in some regards. They had a clay core in this particular area. Not specifically, I don't understand exactly the design here, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. You can see this bedrock. This is competent bedrock or native soils under the ground. This was kind of the uh, starter dam. Uh, again, it was a, a cyclone sand. It's different than this sand. Uh, it had different zones, uh, different lifts and so forth. Uh, and we were commissioned to find out how leakage went through this. Now, this kind of gives you a hint. I drew this up to, to, and I'll come back to this, but we found that right in this location, this is really important, it's called the pinch out point. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. But this is where we found the dam had leaks in, in several locations. And uh, I'll come back to this, this drawing in a second. But what we did, it's kind of what Adam explained, we placed an electrode upstream or an interior to the impoundment, we place an electrode downstream, exterior to the impoundment. We bias electrical current to flow through the ground. Remember, earth materials will not conduct electrical current. They're, they're, when they're dehydrated and dry, earth materials are basically insulators. They won't conduct electrical current. However, when you add water, water is the universal solvent. It gets in, it begins to precipitate out the ions, and it becomes relatively conductive. And so as we bias electrical current to flow through the embankment, it'll take the path of least resistance, which is the water bearing zones. Now, in this particular project, this is such a large dam. Now this is in feet, you can get a fill for the station and you see a scale down here. This is such a large dam that we had to do a number of electrode configurations. This is really interesting. When we first started this project, they said, oh, you cannot go out on uh, the surface of the uh, tailings impoundments, too dangerous. We said, okay. 
So we placed an electrode we could get to just right off the shore line right here in this particular place. And survey one was this green outline. And we biased the electrical current to flow from the interior electrode to the exterior electrode. It was interesting when we did this survey and then we did the yellow survey, this is the second survey number two, and uh, we showed them the results and they were really pleased. And I said, you know, I just don't think the electrode in this position is gonna work very well to, to bias electrical current through this study area. And so we did this red survey right here and sure enough, it was a poor setup. In fact, the electrical current flowed to this, this uh, power line right here and to complete a circuit and didn't kind of concentrate in that area. And we, we, we showed them that. And we said, really to do that, we got to get the electrode out here. And so they said, oh, okay, we'll help you get the electrode out there. So we placed the electrode in this place, this location, and the blue survey was performed. Uh, and it kind of, it, it included the red survey area. So we really did three surveys, but we demonstrated that this wasn't going to work for this area. And so, uh, but, but I'll, 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 I'll go into that in a minute. It's really, electro positioning is really important. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But this is a, this is survey one layout. It's, uh, uh, this is the interior electrode. Here's the exterior electrode. Here's the study area as electrical current. Now this tailings material is quite conducting. It's uh, uh, high, there's a lot of metals in this water. It's very conductive. And you can see these little white lines represent kind of a uniform distribution of electric current. Think of it, that water is about as homogeneous, or this tailings water is as homogeneous as you can be. It spreads out in, in, inside of that uh, embankment, and then it has to find a way through the embankment to its return electrode. Now notice, we place the return electrode uh, uh, downstream, the furthest downstream of these seats right here, it's important to recognize that all of the electrical current concentrates into and out of the electrodes. So they can't be positioned in the study area, nor can the circuit wire go through the study area. The circuit wire is routed out and around the study area. All the electrical current concentrates in this circuit wire as well as in and out of the electrodes. And we're not interested in, in we know where those electrodes are positioned. We know where that circuit wire is positioned. What we're interested in is how does electric current, once it gets away from, from the two electrodes as it, as it propagates to them, what does it do and uh, how does it concentrate? Uh, and, and, and when we take measurements on the surface of the ground, all these little red plus signs that you see here is where we take measurements. Now we carry this instrument, it's, uh, you saw a picture of it, it weighs about 20 pounds. Uh, we carry it from uh, point to point, it takes, uh, about 10 seconds to take a reading and we go to the next measurement. But we cover this, uh, with thousands of readings, uh, 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 measurements of the magnetic field and its intensity. Then, then what we do is we take that data and I, I skipped a couple of steps in here. I'm gonna show another project where uh, I, I, I skipped a step and I, maybe I shouldn't have, but let me, let me explain something to you. We predict what the uh, distribution of electrical current would look like through the subsurface area and it's called the predicted magnetic field. I don't have a, I don't have a figure of that. And then what we do, we predict it and we assume a homogeneous subsurface. Now we know the subsurface is not homogeneous and uh, we don't expect it to be, but you'll see it becomes very apparent in just a minute why we predict, uh, we assume the, the subsurface to be homogeneous. Now we take into account the topography of the site, we take into account the position of the electrodes, the circuit wire, uh, we take into account of the conductive nature of the water and the, non and, and, uh, the conductive nature of the native ground, and, and we can predict what that distribution of electrical current would be. And then we actually measure the magnetic field. And again, I don't have a picture of the magnetic field, but this racial response map, the way this racial response map is generated is we to take the measured magnetic field uh, and we divide it by the, the, by the predicted magnetic field and what we get is a ratio. In other words, if the, if the measured field is exactly the same as the predicted, we color it white. The ratio is one to one. However, if the electric current density is greater than one, we shade it green, meaning there's more electric cur current concentrating in this location that what we'd expect and where we shade it purple, there's less electrical current. 
Now, this is really interesting. This is why I wanted to point this out. This is a very complex pro uh, uh, site. I saw this uh, anomalous feature right here in the, in, the, in the ratio response data. Now, the ratio response is not meant to be interpreted, but it does show and indicate uh, the distribution of electrical current. And what I found is when I, when I started studying this, and really actually after I inverted it and I saw the depth, what we found is you'll note here, this is, this, this is the crest of the dam. Keep in mind that these dashed lines are future uh, raises of the embankment. Uh, this, this area where my cursor is right now, that's, that's the level that we were at uh, at the time of the survey. And that, that was the center of the dam. And this pinch out point, you'll notice that the pinch out point is in front, or I should say downstream of the crest right in this particular area. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing a concentration of the electric current right along that pinch out point. Now we didn't know that at the time. When we get into modeling, we'll, we'll show how we, we discovered that. But, but when, we, when I say we invert it, uh, what the inversion program does is it determines, it predicts or estimates what the distribution of electrical current is in the subsurface to give us that ratio response that we we, we calculated on the surface. And, and I can show you an example of, a, uh, of, the, of the ratio response map. Let me, uh, let me pull that up, right? Whoop, let me uh, get the right one here. Okay, this is, this, is the, uh, this is the viewer. Now notice something, the, I, can take, I can take slices, Elevation slices, I can start right at the crest. There's the crest of the dam and I can slide down through it, elevation slices. I can take cross-sectional slices. I can take longitudinal slices and I can take this information and I can, I can input it into a, into a 3D model. Now we make a 3D model of the site. The clients give us plan views. Here's a plan view of, of the dam. They give us cross-sectional views. They give us LIDAR, they give us the topography, they give us a lot of information, and we build a model. And, and this is what this particular model looks like. Uh, sh let me turn a couple of, uh, let me go to the first scene here, it's a little quicker. This, this is, this is the, the, the model. Now, what's interesting, I, I, need to, I need to say something. We built this model in phases. This, this red shaded color, this is the, this is the first dam, or I, I'm gonna kind of call it the starter dam. And uh, uh, you can see the as-built drawings and you can see that the dam is raised to this point right now. In fact, I can turn, I can get in a little bit closer on this and, and, and here's the plan view of the dam. We can put all that georeference it into our model. Here's the crest as it sits right now. Now this, this is that black shade. That's, that's the crest line right there. And this is, this is the slope. And then, but this starter dam right here was important and I'm, I'm going to, I'll show you that in just a minute why I broke this out the way I did and built the model the way I did. But um, we can take those ECD model slices that I just showed you a minute ago. If I take the ECD model viewer again, oh, I keep grabbing the wrong, uh, the wrong thing. I can take, I can take uh, various slices and I can import that into the model for visualization purposes and interpretation. So you can see you can see here that I, I brought that slice in and I can, I can rotate it up and I can also take and I can take uh, cross-sectional slices. Now what's interesting about this particular project is we found that, that our electrical current kind of concentrated right in front of that pinch out point. And that pinch out point is right at the crest of this dam. That kind of concentrated in front of that pinch out point, but where a, a, it abutted the hillside, there was a, a a, a bed, a bedding plane uh, uh, right here that kind of dips. In fact, I'll, I'll show you how you, you, can, you can see it a little bit better. Not so much here, but you can see the concentration of our electric current. Green shading represents where our electrical current is more concentrated than what we'd expect it to be. The purple's where it's less, ex less expected. And as you, as you can kind of take slices like a card deck, I can look at uh, slices in front of another and I can kind of connect these and show you kind of the flow path through the dam. Now you can actually see that bedding plane kind of dips. This is really good as it kind of goes around the end of the abutment of that starter dam 
It's in that bedding plane, and it actually circumvents around the the uh, the dam. So now let's go to let's go back to my PowerPoint slides for just a second, and l let's just look at some slides. Uh, I showed that that our electric current kind of concentrated in front of the dam. Now there's a few weaknesses. There's a few areas that does go through now. Now disregard the edges. Keep in mind that we didn't take measurement points outside the study area and the inversion it tends to see that like out here in front of the pond, it's quite conductive. It seems to kind of grow green. It's just edge effects. You got to take that into account here. Uh, it's just edge effects. Uh, the reason we don't see edge effects down here is because if I gave you a deeper slice, which I can give you a deeper slice, we have, we don't have edge effects because, because, because we're not at the boundary of the survey. But you have to pay attention and be careful not to, not to, uh, you know, when you're interpreting near edges. But certainly the red arrow kind of points out where the electrical current concentrates. And this gray dashed line right here represents the approximate location of the pinch out point. This is where our electric current concentrated as it followed that seepage flow path out of the reservoir. And, and if I showed you uh, this right here, now this, we can give you all sorts. We can give you slices. We can give you depth slices. We can give you ISO surfaces. There's lots of ways to evaluate and look at this flow path. This happens to be just a, a 50 foot depth slice. In other words, the, the slice follows the contour of the ground down at this 50 foot contour. That's kind of helpful. You can see the, the main flow path uh, pitches right here, kind of follows, uh, it flows around the dam. I don't have the, the, the dam draw, the footprint of the dam, the starter dam there, but it, this is right at the end of it. It flows right through a bedding plane. And then what it does, is it comes down here and it starts to daylight out and, and some continues to go on down the canyon. And so, uh, you know, we can take individual slices. This is, this is if you go back to this uh, section AA prime, I'm taking a, a section uh, uh, right through the, through the model and, and in place embedded in the 3D model, but you can see the depth. In fact, I can show you, I can show you, if I take the, another section, I can show you from this cross section where the, the, own, the client had elevations, I can show you the exact elevation of that pinch out point. That pinch out point occurs about right here. You can see the concentration of that flow path uh, right in here where it's the darkest uh, green. And then it, it's going, it's going around the abutment, so it goes where the circle is, it's going into the page, and where this arrow comes out, it's coming back out of the page. It kind of goes around there, and, that, and that's, uh, that, that's the uh, downstream embankment. But, but you can start to identify and, and characterize the seepage flow paths. Now, I described to you how seepage, we found a seepage path that went around kind of the starter dam, and it's contributing to this seepage right here. Uh, we did find some other seepage flow paths. Now, this is a Another depth slice, it's a little bit deeper. This is a little bit deeper section of the dam. But notice right here that we have kind of a weakness uh, across the, what I call the crest of that starter dam. You can see purple shading here. Now we got edge effects and edge effects, be careful, but you got purple shading here, purple shading here. There's kind of a weak area where it's flowing through that pinch out point or flows towards that pinch out point. And then right here is the pinch out. This is the pinch out point and water, uh, comes down and it hits this point, it kind of bifurcates around this hill. Some of it comes down into here and some of it comes down into here. And I can take sections again, this CC prime, this is kind of interesting. Uh, this, this CC prime, we're looking upstream through the dam. This is the elevation of the pinch out point right there. And you see that electrical current concentrate there and concentrate right to there. Now, notice this, you, send, you see evidence of this, this vertical chimney. Remember, when I was, when I showed you this flow path on the back side of this clay core right here, they put a, a, a vertical chimney and then kind of a, a chimney, a, a blanket, a drain blanket down here. And our electrical current comes through there and drops right down that chimney blanket. Now watch this. Uh, uh, oops, I got to get to the right. I've showed you those slides already. This is that, this is that concentration and then it's flowing down in the chimney blanket. Now, I'm going to give you a section here that's, that's CC prime. Now, uh, this was CC prime. Now, what I'm going to do in this next view is I'm going, to, I'm going to pay attention to where C prime is located. I'm going to go around the back side of it. Now, this is the back side. There's C prime right there. Instead of looking upstream, I'm kind of looking downstream now through it. And the reason I, 
I, I chose this cross-sectional slide. It was the closest uh, uh, cross-section to, to our seat location. And you'll note that the right here is the pinch-out point. And I drew a line right over here. That's the pinch-out point. And then the vertical drain, the vertical chimney sits right in here. And that's, that's the vertical chimney. And then it starts to flow down in the drain blanket and it gets a little bit weaker. But in the next slide, I think it shows it really good. Now this is another section and another little bit of location, but you certainly see that vertical chimney right here. Now again, remember this is the, you're not looking at the crest of the, the finished dam, you're looking at the crest of the starter dam. And, and what's happening is that seepage kind of flows uh, uh, through that pinch out point that's right here, it goes down the vertical chimney drain and then drains out uh, down here towards the toe of the dam. And, and in the bottom line, to summarize this investigation, what we did is we uh, were able to identify uh, the primary seepage flow paths. These yellows are the, are the secondary. These are inferred. These thicker dashed yellow lines are kind of inferred, but it's important. We were able to give them coordinates. This point one, two, three, four, five, six. These are coordinates that the client wanted to have to uh, prove these, these uh, locations in point six and seven, eight, nine. I didn't provide the coordinates for you because uh, of... Uh, I told the client that I wouldn't ex expose the site. Now, there's another case study here. I'm going to move along kind of quickly because I've got more information to cover here. This is a mine pit investigation. We had a, we had a client, a large mining company. Uh, they had a, uh, a, uh, a pit. Uh, and on the east, east wall here, they had seepage uh, coming through uh, the hillside. And they, they had a hard time characterizing it. They put several wells upstream. You can see one, two, three, four. I've seen, I've seen projects where they've been, had over 100 wells and not been able to identify the seepage flow paths. And then they have a number of wells down a little bit lower and they're trying to characterize this flow path, having a difficult time. And they called and said, can you characterize? We said, certainly. So we place an electrode here upstream in a well in contact with the groundwater regime. We placed an electrode down here, the lowest part of the pit, in another well that's completed in, 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 in the uh, groundwater regime. And we bias electrical current. Now notice the, these little yellow lines represent the uniform distribution of electrical current, kind of in a homogeneous assumed uh, condition. We have our circuit wire that goes out and around the study area. We, we, we don't want it to be the dominant signal. We want the current that's flowing through the ground when we take measurements on the surface of the ground to be the dominant signal. Now note, we could only take measurements on the benches too steep and dangerous any, any place else. So we just took measurements on the, on the, on the benches. And uh, here's this, here's just a, you know, a typical cross section. We got our upgrading electrode. We have our downgrading electrode. Uh, you kind of see that we're placing that electrode so it's in the, uh, the seat location. The seat manifestation is kind of in the barrel of the gun, so to speak. We bias our electrical current through it. Now, this is why I, I, did, I skipped before, and I should have shown you this before. This is the predicted magnetic field. Now, think of it as kind of like throwing a rock into a pond. The uh, current and the magnetic field radiate out uniformly uh, from the, the upgrading electrode. Then it, and it, it kind of uniforms out, and then it get, goes back down to the lower electrode. But it's kind of got a uniform flow. That's the predicted field. Then we have our measured field. Uh, this is the actual measured field. Now it looks similar to the predicted field, and it should. This is a hard rock. It's relatively homogeneous. It has some heterogeneity to it, and we're going to bring that out. And the way we bring that he heterogeneity out is we take this uh, observed magnetic field or the measured magnetic field, we divide it by the predicted magnetic field, and we get a ratio response map. The ratio meaning uh, the, the uh, where it's green shaded, it, the, the electric current is more concentrated than we'd expect it, and the purple where it's less. Now, again, just looking at the ratio response map, I can see a flow path that's, that's, that's coming from the north down and not, and not from the east. Now, when we inverted the data, uh, we, we run it through our inversion, and then we, we build a, a model of the site. Now, these are contours and, and LIDAR and, and wells, depths, and locations and all that. We put all the information that they have on their site into our models. And then we insert our ECD model slices. Now what you're looking at here is a series of east-west oriented vertical ECD model slices. 
and you can really start to see the flow path as it comes down to the purple shading is where our electrical current isn't getting. Uh, uh, and you can see this purple shading up here. Our electrode, I think, is in, I can't remember one of these well, one of these two wells here. But as it comes out of there, it, it hurries and concentrates in that groundwater flow path and shows us the flow path as it infiltrates the pit. And it's up here to the north and not, and not to where they thought it was. Now, this is another, I, this, is, this is a series of elevation slices. You can see how well that flow path shows up right here. If I turn this elevation slice on and turn others, you'd, you'd see the flow path a little bit better. Also, I can make an isosurface of that flow path. An isosurface is just an, electric, an equally electrical potential zone, I guess, uh, in the ground, and, and it just highlights that flow path in kind of a, a three-dimensional uh, aspect. I can also take a section. I can take like a cross section. This CC is cutting through the uh, through the seepage flow path, and you can see here that I think that this is a potential fracture zone in that hard rock. Uh, this is a great you know mine companies should use this technology to to help identify these these weaknesses and these these flow paths. I'll show you another technology that's really good at this too in just a second. But the bottom line is we 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 help this client understand how water infiltrates their pit. Now this uh, this next uh, I've got to hurry along here to get through. This is very interesting. This is a well site and study. This is a uh, this is in Idaho Springs, Idaho. This is uh, this is in the United States. Idaho is in the western part of the United States. They had a spring. It's called it's called Formation Spring, and it produces about three thousand gallons per minute flows up out of the ground. And uh, the community of Soda Springs, uh, they are around about 2,500 and then the surrounding community has probably another 1,500, 2,000 people. So a population of about four or 5,000 people. This spring supplies both culinary water and irrigation water. Well, the Department of Environmental Quality, the Drinking Water uh, Department came along and they condemned this spring. And the reason they condemned it is because when they took water samples of it, they found animal and plant coliform in the water. And, and they deemed it, uh, you know, not safe to drink. And, and, and the water is just kind of burbling up into this little bit of a pond reservoir, and then they capture it and take it to town. Well, birds and animals and plants and things like that uh, were polluting, polluting the water. And so they said, look, uh, you're going to have to treat the water. And so all the engineers in the Western United States heard about this. They, they're ambulance chasers. They ran to this job, and uh, they wanted to build a microfiltration treatment plant at the cost of about uh, 12 to $15 million is what the estimated cost was. And uh, then they would supply all the water to both culinary and, and irrigation. And uh, uh, the other choice they had is they could just, they could just treat a little bit of the water, build like a two or three million dollar treatment plant for their culinary needs, but that would require them to build a distribution to another distribution system, one for their irrigation and one for their, their culinary water at, at a tune of about another 20 to $30 million. And they said that we're just not going to do that. And, and so they contacted me and they said, can you find this water source? Uh, can you find where that water's coming up from depth? Uh, and you have to find it at 200, 200 feet away from the source and at 100 feet below the ground surface. Well, that's a big, that's a pretty tall order. You've got, you've got all this real estate that you've got to investigate to find out where that water is. And so, but we said, yeah, we can do it. And so what we did is we placed an electrode in contact with the spring. There's some farmhouses up over here. There was, a, there was a well that was in contact with the groundwater and there was a little bit over here. We energized different, different directions. And what we found is we found an anomaly right here at 210 feet away from the spring. It's just amazing. Now here, this is an isosurface. And what this is, where my cursor is right here, this is the range front fault. And we believe that the range front fault uh, acts as a barrier. And, and in other words, it, it's not as acting as a conduit. It's acting as a barrier and forcing as the water comes, migrates down, it hits this barrier and forces the water to the surface and it flows up here. So we placed a well right in this particular area. Uh, and, and what was interesting is uh, uh, that when they drilled this well, I can tell you a little history about it. This is, this is well number one. They drilled this well right here. 
and they got down to about 170 feet and they drilled it with this is a six inch well and it produced about Oh, it produced about six, uh, no, 400 gallons per minute out of that six inch well. That, that well was at capacity. And they said, we hit the mother load. And so we said, well, great, congratulations. And so they, they ring this, this well out to an 18 inch diameter well, and they test pumped it, and they broke suction at about 600 gallons per minute. A far cry from the 3,000 gallons per minute that they were hoping for. And so they said, what do we do? And I, they said, should we drill deeper? And I said, well, I can't guarantee going deeper is going to do anything. Uh, and ignore this map right here. Just, just ignore this map. This is a different map. Uh, and so what they did is they decided to experiment around. They went and drilled another well here, and they got a couple hundred gallons per minute artesian. They went down here. I don't know what they were doing when they thought to drill there, way out of bounds. And then they drilled another well here, got a couple hundred gallons per minute. And so they decided to go deeper, and they took this well down to 450 feet uh, about, and they, and, they, and they hit another uh, supply of water that increased this well to about 25, 2,600 gallons per minute artesian flow. And so they were pretty satisfied with that, but they didn't get as much as was flowing out of here. And so we came back and we said, you know, we're interested. We've developed a couple of more techniques uh, that we want to demonstrate to you and to our clients, you guys especially. And so one is called the gamma survey. Gamma is known, it's not proprietary to us, but, but the earth emits gamma rays. And, and one of the things that uh, uh, the block the gamma rays are water. And so we did a gamma survey and you can see we got this kind of this shadow footprint, this dark blue is where our gamma drops significantly. Now that doesn't mean that that's where the water's coming up from depth or anything. It could be coming up and spreading out. We, we didn't quite know what to kind of think of that, but it was kind of interesting that that gamma survey uh, showed us that. But then we did a technique that's called RAPS. Or, or RAPS. It's called RAPS, Rapid Acoustic Profiling, and it's a technique that's unique to us. Uh, we weren't the inventors of it, but we're, 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 we got a close relationship to the inventor, and, 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 and what it does is it's a uh, it listens to uh, the movement of the earth. The earth. People don't realize that the earth is like, a, is like a big water balloon. It's continually stretching and moving with the planetary motions around the earth and so forth. And it creates resonance. It cre as the rock rubs against each other, it creates resonance. And you can determine where you have weak rock or where you have competent rock. And what was interesting is this is an isosurface of that ramp investigation. Now, what's interesting is... When we drilled down to here to about the 170 feet, we got a lot of water. And then uh, they got out of it and they developed that, didn't have enough water. So they eventually did go deeper. And down here, they encountered another significant amount of water. But what was interesting is the wrap showed a real uh, uh, weak joint right in here. And we think if we'd have moved that well over there to have a lot more water and probably may not have had to go as deep to intercept that fracture. But nonetheless, this was a very successful project. And the reason I share this with you is because um, you've got, uh, you've got uh, a, 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 a means to kind of uh, at several layers, I should say, or several different, totally different techniques that you can apply to a site to help you understand and characterize the groundwater flow. Now, I'm going to really cut it short here. Uh, this, is a, this, is, this fourth case study that I've got is called a compare investigation. And a compare survey is just a repeat survey. Now, this was a dam that we did uh, in Germany uh, in, in 2015. And in this particular investigation in 2015, we found a seepage flow path around the north abutment, right, in, right at the north abutment contact. And, and uh, we recommended that they, they put a grout curtain to cut it off. And they came in here with a grout curtain, and this is the grout curtain that they installed. But it was really interesting to us, that's not where we told them to put the grout curtain. We told them to put the grout curtain here. This is, this is a copy right out of the re recommended report, and I inserted their, their grout curtain. And I said to them on the phone, they called me and they said, hey, you know, we, we did this, we did what you told us to do, but we still got seepage. We've cut a lot of it out, but we still got a lot of seepage. And so I said, well, show me what you did. So we, in, we took their data, their grout data, and we and placed it in the map, and I said, well, look, you didn't, you didn't go far enough. We, we, we expect the seepage to flow around your grout curtain. And they said, can you prove that? And I said, certainly. 
And the way we could prove that is we did a repeat survey. We put an electrode upstream exactly in the location we did on the original survey. We put an electrode downstream exactly in the position we did in the original survey. We put the circuit wire in the exact same position. We took measurements in the exact same locations within centimeters of, of where we took it. And this is a difference. This map is called a difference map. And you see up here in this graph, the difference. Remember the law of, of continuity. If we energize this site exactly the way we did it, if we put in a grout curtain and there's less, less electrical curtain going through this area now with shaded blue because there's less electrical current in the difference map. However, where the red is, we have increased electric current flow. And notice this, we, we said, look, it's, it's, it's plain as day. The electric, you didn't bring this, this curtain far enough into this uh, tighter formation here. And so what you've got is you've got electrical current that flows around, that flows around your, your sheet pile wall. And they had since gone and grouted this and remediated like 95% of the seepage. So now in summary, I've kind of gone five minutes over my time, but in summary, I just want to summarize this. You know, traditional realistic investigations are used to locate, model, and predict subsurface water flow paths and patterns in three dimensions for a variety of applications in geologic settings. I noticed when Adam gave his opening presentation, he said the Willow Stick has done over 300 investigations. Well, that's a few years ago. Today, uh, actually, we're, more, we're near 400 major, major water investigations throughout the world. For some of the most uh, sophisticated clientele, and engineers, dam owners in the world. And 80% and and, and, and of those clients have had us back for repeat business. So if it doesn't work, we'd, it would have flushed it out by now. Then I just want to point out that a willow stick compare investigation, that's an, really interesting. That effectively adds a fourth dimension by considering the temporal effects of an investigation. You know, for example, in many cases, the need to see the trend of changes taking place over time is more significant than the need to understand a precise model of the way things exist today. And we find that's true. We, we've worked with mining companies. They, they kind of get a base map and then they go in and do a lot of mining. We come back periodically and we see the trend of changes and how they're impacting the, the environment. We see that the same thing, we, we've done dams that have leaks when the water level's high and then low. We survey when it's low, we survey when it's high, and we actually see the trend, the change. Very educational and very powerful tool. Well, that's my end of my, my presentation and I've used up my time. I, I appreciate your attendance. And so I'll turn it back over to uh, Adam. Thanks Val, thank you very much for that. So now I guess I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, we've got a couple of questions uh, already, but I'd just like to remind participants that there's a Q&A box uh, at the toolbar at the bottom of, uh, of the Zoom uh, screen. And uh, if they could put in their questions uh, regarding this uh, technology, I'm uh, more than happy to answer them uh, now. But I'll start off with the first two questions. I'll just read them out and then uh, we can talk to those. So the first question is, the cost of the Willistic surveys is higher compared to other geophysical techniques and it's sometimes hard to justify clients. It would help if you could provide some justification for the higher costs, i.e. is it mainly processing time? So potentially, uh, Val, maybe you could go into a bit of detail in respect to the processing uh, as well as the uh, the time that you guys take to bring up the models and things like that. And we can also talk about the field time as well, because that's a significant component. You know, uh, Adam, let me just say, was that the first question? Have you ever had any failed projects? Is that the question? That was the second question. Yeah, that was the, the first one was just the, the, we've, the had, we've, had, we've, we've had some, I, I don't know if they failed. Uh, there's been projects where we may have not answered all of the clients questions and problems, but, uh, one, one time we did a project, I did not know this, but there's, there's places in this world where groundwater do not ha does not have ions. And uh, if, there's, if the water's not ionized some way, now we're, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about drinking water quality. We can, we can, we can do uh, 
surveys with as low as uh, uh, 100 microsiemens per centimeter of, of conductivity. Very, very low, very clean, very high quality water. But there are waters that don't have any ions in them. And we could, if you can't get a circuit to flow through the ground, you cannot, you cannot do an investigation. And so, and so it's important that, uh, and, and also too, and for example, I've had a few projects where we put electrodes down a well, come to find out the well's plugged, there's no perforation, we can't get electrical current to flow. You've got to be able to bias the electrical current through the ground. If you do, that electrical current doesn't lie. It takes the path of least resistance. That's a fact. And we can measure its distribution and its flow through the ground. Out of probably those 400 projects that we've done, I can only think of two or three that we weren't successfully able to complete because of, of uh, uh, you know, no ions or, or kind of just not being able to get a circuit real unusual kind of a setup, but we found those things early in the project and we were able to just go to the client and say, hey, we can't get it to work and we reduce the cost of the investigation. Beautiful. Well, the other question that he had for you was just the cost seems to be higher than other geophysical techniques. Do you want to kind of just speak to that? Well, I can say this much, you know, it would be great to do a whole seminar on or a webinar on uh, the return on investment with the Willistic investigation. I can't, that you, you can't, I, you can't, you wouldn't believe how many projects I've gone where they've used every geophysical technique you can think of. They've drilled wells and we've come in and set up and been able to uh, define what the problem is and how water's moving and, and confirm, uh, confirm that. And, and I, I, you know, the will stick technique, uh, the return on investment is usually, you know, real impressive uh, compared to, you know, other geophysical techniques that may be a little bit more expensive than like traditional resistivity, but it's, it's a lot more powerful. And uh, it doesn't replace well drilling or anything. I don't want to give you the impression of that. But what it does say, tell you, it tells you where to start focusing your remediation efforts or your monitoring efforts or your, you know, ground truthing efforts. And uh, it, it, it's always been a, a, a cost-effective approach. I'll just add to that that um, it's not necessarily in processing time and it's not necessarily in field work time. It's probably the cost might be a little more because of the 3D modeling and all of the additional consulting services that we spend a lot of time on on uh, conference calls uh, with the client. Uh, we add a lot into our 3D modeling. And I think uh, other geophysics tech techniques don't spend as much time in that consulting services and 3D modeling. So I think that's where you have a justification in, in our, uh, our technique being a little bit more expensive. Beautiful, thank you, Ryan and Val. The next question. How does Willistic handle things like landfill contents, i.e. with lots of metal items, et cetera? Well, let me, let me answer it this way. Um, landfill contents don't really have a major effect. For example, uh, remember, we're placing electrode at point A, we're placing electrode at point B, and the electrical current is being influenced by things that are helping complete the circuit. Now, if I have a barrel or a still cased well that's just a vertical well, it really doesn't help complete the circuit. It's just a it's just a six or eight inch well, or four inch well, or two inch metal well, or a four inch four foot barrel. It doesn't really help complete the circuit from point A to point B. Remember, we place we place these electrodes uh, thousands of feet and uh, meters, uh, you know, three. 400, 900 meters apart. And that little bit of debris doesn't really help complete the circuit. What the electrical current does, it gets out in the water bearing zones, they're long continuous conductors. Now, if you have a, if you had a metal feature that was long conductor, like a railroad track, like a fence line, and you placed your electrodes so that it became the path of least resistance, then your electrical current would get on that. When we go to a site, we ask the client to give us all of the conductive culture. When I mean by conductive culture, it's any man-made feature that's metal that's a long continuous conductor. Pipelines, power lines, fences, railroad tracks. Uh, and and when, we, when we map those out, we set up the surveys to uh, 
have minimum, minimal impacts on the survey. But at the same time, too, we can model some of those effects out or simply we take those into account when we're interpreting the data. So uh, it, they are problematic, but uh, again, I could show you lots of projects where we've done some, uh, it's been a lot of conductive culture and been able to uh, set up a survey that, that gives us the kind of answer that we're looking for. Fantastic. The next question, if you had a utility pit, i.e. sewer stormwater, would you also be able to follow the groundwater flow outside of that utility, trying to work out if the contaminated groundwater is migrating? Yeah, if you have a, if you had a, if you had a stormwater or sewer, uh, uh, stormwater pit or whatever, you put electrode inside of it, you put an electrode downstream. Again, you kind of want to focus your electric current to flow, uh, you know, down the barrel of the gun. You want to kind of flow it downstream. Uh, you look at the topography or you look at water levels in uh, some mod modern wells. You, you, you aim your, your current and it, it will take the path. It'll, it'll identify the, the water bearing zone, the flow path. If you've if you have a utility, uh, sorry, if you have you applied this technology to landfills to characterize leachate flow paths within and beyond a landfill? Yeah, in fact, you have a, we, you, you know, we, you, you prepared this slideshow originally and you, we had a, a project that we did for a large, uh, uh, it was a brownfield, whatever you call it. It's a government site that they took over a big landfill, leachate. Uh, flowing away from this site. Very neat. Uh, they've been papers written on it. Uh, we've done that on several occasions, uh, uh, mapping uh, leachate out of landfills. So yes, it's, a, it's an application that we can do. What are the common limitations to the project? There's a couple there. What are the basic data needed from the client and do you supply 3D outputs of models to clients and how do you package this? So maybe we just start off with the first one in regards to the, the common limitations to the project. I'm going to answer the first question. Uh, what are the common limitations to the project? You know, again, we have to, uh, I don't like to place the, the electrodes much over two or three kilometers apart, preferably, you know, like a, a, a kilometer, maybe half a kilometer, something like that. I don't like to get them too close. I can, we can put them within, you know, 50 meters or something like that, but it's you're biasing the electric current strongly through the ground. What we're interested in is get, get those electrodes out kind of way far apart from each other, and then as the current flows out into the ground, it'll just naturally start to concentrate in the paths of least resistance. Uh, you know, so the size is sometimes, again, if the, si if, the, if the project area we're doing is so large, and that was a great example of that first project I showed you, we, we, we divide the the study area into smaller uh, study areas and, and, and investigate it and then kind of piece it together as to, so we have one large survey. Also, if we have a lot of conductive culture, I mean, if you, if you were in a steel yard or something like that, it, there may be too much conductive culture on top of the ground where our electrical current wouldn't get in the ground. One thing people say, how deep can you go and things like that? Well, if you can't bias the electrical current at depth, it's very difficult. I mean, if you if you, all you have is electrodes on the surface, your electrical current's gonna concentrate at the surface. We've done projects like for Chevron, uh, where we're down 1,800 feet, but they have wells to get our electrodes down there. So we've been very successful at those kind of depths. But uh, it, there are limitations, uh, and uh, those are the ones on the top of my head. Ryan, do you wanna answer what are the basic that they need? And yes, absolutely. So. We send, uh, and, and Hydroterra helps us, when a client is interested um, at no cost to you, oh good, and Adam's even pulled it up. We, pr we give you a pre-proposal checklist. And uh, you, you can see there's three columns there. And uh, we really need the first column. So that information required for a proposal, you know, the location of the site, uh, the map with area of interest delineated, and then a description of the site and groundwater situation. And then we also like to understand what is expected of Willistic in the investigation. 
Now there's other two other columns that really help us uh, hone in on our understanding and on and on our proposal and cost estimate. Sometimes we don't get that information until um, after we've been on site and we've been contracted with the client, um, and that's fine too. But uh, we really, we really, before we actually go mobilize, we like to get the conductive culture, the utility map, um, all the metal. Um, we like to understand well logs, um, any sinkholes, ponds, or anything like that as well. So that kind of gives you a list of, of the information that we have that we'd like to get. And the final one was uh, the 3D output of the models. So how is this packaged? to send to clients yeah regarding uh, the 3d output we we uh have um we use uh oh and i can't remember val do you remember the name of it that's google sketchup sketchup yes we use sketchup uh, but we can put it in a format for our clients uh if they have a 3D model that they use like LeapFrog or there's, there's other 3D models, uh, we can provide you with the raw data to put into your 3D model. And we're happy to give that to you um, and then give you kind of a training course on what to look at, like Val mentioned about edge effects and that stuff so that, so that when you put it into your 3D model, you understand what you're looking at. But the other thing that we do when clients don't have a 3D model is we just provide you with a, a scene. Val was showing you some of the scenes on some of those, um, on some of those case studies. And we'll also provide that to our client where, where they can go in and look at each scene and each, uh, each, uh, different uh, area that they want to really hone in on and, and uh, understand and characterize. The next question, does the Willistic method determine groundwater seepage rates or is it a spatial distribution only? It's a, it's a spatial distribution only. Uh, we have, we have done some work with, uh, uh, you know, when you do a mod flow uh, type of a, uh, modeling, traditional model where you have to predict what the uh, uh, hydraulic conductivity is. We, we've actually, if the, if the client has wells in and knows the hydraulic conductivity and we've surveyed the area, we can, uh, we can correlate, or uh, th maybe the right word is not correlate, maybe it's uh, calibrate uh, their water model to be a little bit better where, the, where we have zones of higher effective porosity, we have lower effective porosity. And we've, we've had some good results with that, uh, although we're not uh, traditional groundwater model experts in that, in that regard, and we need to work with uh, uh, engineers that, that, that are. Are there health and safety issues associated with electricity, and does this present a roadblock to implementing this technology across some sites? Well, th there's electric current in that wire, but the electrical current, it's just really interesting. The, the voltage we use is less than 300 volts. Normally it's around, I'm gonna say 100, 150 volts. The amperage is only two amps. Two amps is just enough maybe to light a light bulb. And so, you know, it's like any appliance that you have, uh, you treat it with respect. You know, you don't stick your fingers into plugs and things like that. We also have what's called the circuit fault interrupter on our circuit. If, they, if somebody comes in contact and were to break that circuit or change the, the flow of electrical current, it, the, we, we energize the ground at 380 and, and, uh, hertz. And the reason that we use 380 hertz, it's not a harmonic of your 60 or your 50 cycle that's prevalent through the, through the world. And if, if, if that current in, in that circuit wire is interrupted by uh, three, 300 80th of a second, it shuts the circuit down. So it's even quicker than your, your uh, GFIs that you have on your homes and your bathrooms. So we, we take precaution, uh, but no, we're not dealing with large voltages and amperages, and uh, it's, it, it's relatively safe. We've been doing it for 15 years and haven't had any accidents. Uh, i just add to that also, we also engage with the clients too and, and go through the full OHS procedure. We send through all the documentation and make sure that everyone is aware uh, prior to uh, conducting the field work of uh, the health and safety 
measures that need to be put in place to ensure, as what Val said, that, that nothing uh, does occur uh, and that we're on top of it if, if anything um, does come up as, as it does in field work. Um, next question. Is the method able to differentiate between saturated clays and saturated sand? Would both be similarly highly conductive, but flow regime very different? You know, yeah, the answer to that is yes, it can differentiate between saturated sands and saturated clays. They have different uh, porosities. And again, uh, uh, the electrical current will concentrate where it's, it has the least path. But uh, a lot of people are hung up on wet clays. So, you know, we've been taught in textbooks that wet clays are super conductive. Well, uh, I, they are conductive, but uh, I, I've got some experimental information that I could share that if you had if you had wet clays it'd be conductive but if you had uh, free flowing water in wet clays uh, they would be more conductive and so um, that's a that's probably a, another seminar for another day but the, the, the simple answer here is yes we can dif differentiate between saturated clays and sands. Can willow stick map induced stream bed infiltration due to quarry pit dewatering? Um, I'm not sure. Induced stream bed infiltration. Um, you mean if, 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 you, if you're watering a pit and, and the stream began to uh, dry up, could we, could we determine that? Um, there, there's some there's some coal mines that I work with back east in the eastern part of the United States where they have there's a law if you if you start mining uh, underground and you disrupt the surface flow they have to restore that stream flow and we've placed electrodes down in wells deep down into the mine and then we we put them in the streams and we we survey along the streams to see where that electrical current stops flowing down the stream stops and starts to flow down into the earth and we've been successful at identifying where uh, they are dewatering these streams and they go back in and do a grout program and restore the flow to the streams. I'm not sure I'm answering that question but that's the experience that we've had. Can these investigations be undertaken close to power lines or power stations? Yes. Yes, as I told you, we energize at 380 hertz, which is not a harmonic of your 50 or your 60 hertz cycle. We, we could be right under a power line. We don't care. That, that, 50, that 50 hertz or that 60 hertz is filtered out. We are, we are listening to our heartbeat, beat, which is 380 hertz. It's not a harmonic. It's, we, can, we can do it right under power lines. Can you identify a difference between water quality, such as saline and freshwater interface? Yeah, we've done some investigations with uh, saltwater intrusion. Now, if you, if you were talking to me about a chemical, for example, you had a contaminant that's in the water, I don't think that changes the conductivity enough. It has to be in like an order of magnitude. Now, uh, salt water is probably an order of magnitude more conductive than regular water. And when we energize from a salt water uh, source to a freshwater source, you see the change in conductivity in the ground, especially along the preferential flow paths. Beautiful. Well, that looks like that's the end of, oh, sorry, just another question popped up. My question about power lines was due to the magnetic field created by them, not the electrical risk. Again, the, the, the magnetic field has the same characteristics as the electric field. In other words, if you're energizing at a certain frequency, a 50 hertz frequency, the magnetic field has a 50 hertz frequency. We're filtering those frequencies out. So the magnetic field uh, doesn't have any. Now, if you were uh, within a foot or two of the power line, it would probably interfere. But if you stayed 50 feet away from it, you know, uh, and, and again, it's important to know where all these are. So when we plan to lay out the surveys, we know what we're dealing with and we survey around those or, or we, survey, we survey right on them and we actually locate uh, uh, where those power lines are and the influence that they're having on the survey and we can actually model them out. 
Beautiful. That looks like that's the uh, final question. Okay. Adam, I might just say a couple of words to, to wrap up. No worries, Richard. So thanks very much to our speakers today, particularly Val, who's uh, done the lion's share of the work today. I'm sure people found his wisdom very valuable. The, the experience we've had with Willow Stick um, over the years that we've been the distributor here in Australia has been very positive. I think the high success rate uh, that they achieve on individual projects relates to a couple of factors. One, obviously a huge amount of experience doing a lot of similar projects. And I think that's what in part differentiates them from the other geophysical techniques that are out there is they've managed to really fine tune their methodology for groundwater more than anyone else in the world. The second thing is they are actually very careful at the front end of the project. And we've had some opportunities here in Australia where the decision has been made that willow stick is not the right technology to use in a particular application. So that in itself increases the chances of success overall because you know, you're being very careful what you take on. So we found it um, a very positive experience working with willow stick. In terms of once the project starts, we've worked on several projects with willow stick now, if the data is not showing up, they continue to change the electrode configuration to give themselves the best possible chance. Sometimes, you know, we've done three or four different configurations on the one project to get that data. So I think very thorough on the job, very thorough selecting the jobs they take on and a huge amount of experience all lead to a positive outcome for the clients. So thanks very much to everyone presenting here today and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your days. Cheers.